You are listening to Something Rather Than Nothing. Creator and host, Ken Vellante. Editor and producer, Peter Bauer. Hi, I'm Kinnerit Ely, and this is Something Rather Than Nothing. When Ken invited me to guest host this episode, I knew I wanted to invite Jonathan Blaylock. I'll briefly introduce him. Jonathan Blaylock has had an incredible career as a singer. Among his starring roles in the standard repertory were Don Ottavio in Mozart's Don Giovanni and Ferrando in Mozart's Così Fan Tutte and uh, Count Almaviva in Rossini's The Barber of Seville and Prince Ramiro in La Cenerentola. He also sang the title role in the world premieres of two highly acclaimed operas, Prince Claus in Mark Adamo's Becoming Santa Claus at the Dallas Opera, and Paul in Gregory Spears' uh, Paul's Case with Urban Arias, and in the released recordings of both operas. He is now working with the Atlanta Opera in their development department, and those who work in development are among the unsung heroes of the arts. And we'll talk more about development throughout the interview. John, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for inviting me. It's so good to speak with you again. Hey, so uh, let's uh, get right to it. So tell us, what are your early mem- earliest memories of the arts and performing? It definitely began for me with my family in church. And my mother and father met while they were both in college choir in a production of Ruddigor, <laughs> Gilbert oh, and Sullivan. Oh my gosh. And music brought them together. They were in a little touring group together in their college and they ended up my mother as a full-time piano teacher and accompanist at church. And she says that while I was in her belly <laughs> and she was playing in church, I would kick along in rhythm with the oh music. So clearly <laughs> I had an affinity for music from a very early age. <laughs> and I started taking piano lessons when I was four years old from my mother. And we sang as a family, all five of us, brother, sister, and parents and I, in five part harmony, a cappella, and all these things. And we sang in our own church and also toured to a few other churches. So it was a little like the Von Trapp family uh, minus <laughs> <laughs> World War II. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> oh, my and I, God. And I loved it. And it was something that we did for religious reasons and also just for the passion of music. And that was always important to our family. And it was more sacred music than it was classical music at that age. And that was kind of the entry point to other forms of music. Mm, that's really beautiful. I love that the Blaylock family singers. <laughs> no, but that is such a fantastic, um, a fantastic introduction to music. And, uh, you know, and then uh, especially uh, when you, people have a background in music and especially with their families, it's not necessarily a given that they would go into the arts and especially professionally. So it's incredible that you did. So tell us, uh, when and how did you know that you were going to go into the arts? I did not always know. For me, I started as pre-med in college and oh, wow. I wanted to be a doctor and I was training for all that. I was taking the labs. I was taking all the science courses, but always with a music minor because I had a scholarship. <laughs> and so I enjoyed doing that, but I always thought it was something that I would just keep going on the side. It turned out that I hated labs. I hated staring down a microscope for hours on end. And though academically I was doing fine, my biggest passion was working with people. And I was always taking those music courses I had to for my minor. So I said, well, why don't I just continue with what seems to be working here? And then I got an undergrad in sacred music. And then I sang with a Essentially, this is going to sound very strange. Christian show choir at this place oh, called wow. Lake Junaluska. They were called the Junaluska Singers. It's this Methodist camp slash resort slash retirement center slash conference center. And it was 16 professional 
singers who were there for three months. And I always loved choral music. And that's what we did. And I said, I was having such a great time. How can I keep doing what I'm loving here? And I said, well, I know I'll get a master's in choral conducting. So I got my undergrad in sacred music, master's in choral conducting, and I wanted to be the next Robert Shaw. Teaching choirs, performing with choirs, maybe working in a university and a church at the same time. And then when I was in UNC Greensboro, while I was studying to get my master's in choral conducting, I started taking voice lessons seriously because I said, if I'm going to teach choirs, the instrument, just like if I'm conducting an orchestra, I have to know what the human voice does and really be able to work with it on a technical level. And then I fell in love with singing and then I fell in love with opera <laughs> yes. through that. And that's kind of my long and winding road to the opera world. Oh, but that's so incredible because uh, you also not only did you eventually uh, end up in opera, of course, but you ended up having ex uh, experience with uh, a variety of different kinds of music. So uh, how wonderful to have that as well with sacred music and also choral music. So, uh, and the, the keyboard background of studying piano throughout made me a stronger musician to be able to teach myself roles. And people who don't have some kind of an instrumental background and end up going into singing sometimes struggle with that as a challenge of the theory and all of the musicology part of it because everyone loves to sing but not every well not everyone loves to sing <laughs> but the other parts sometimes people have to beef up that part of music education and for me I was lucky in that way that I came that route mm, absolutely and uh, I, I would say a in general uh, you're, you're absolutely right and then b especially with 21st century opera which we'll go more into that later but uh, but that is such an asset that uh, you had that background, you had that training. And, uh, and actually, we'll go more into depth about that. And this next question will be a bit of a two-parter. And uh, so I want to chat a little bit more in depth about your path in the arts. So first of all, as a, si a singer, so with your training and your career, and then also now in development. So how you got started in development and also your experience at Atlanta Opera. I'm trying to think where to start here. <laughs> I, I was, it's a lot. <laughs> when I was first taking voice lessons at UNC Greensboro, I was not a voice major. And my professor, Carla Lefevre, I'm very close with her to this day. But my first lesson, I started singing. First of all, I was doing very challenging choral music, singing first tenor, which sat at a very high vocal range, tessitura. And I had no technical knowledge of how to do that. So I was putting a lot of strain on my voice and my muscles were very tight. And also I was battling acid reflux. And so the vocal folds were constantly inflamed. And so it's almost like an Olympic runner who has a sprained ankle running on it constantly at a very high speed all day. <laughs> that was kind of what I was doing to my voice. And the first day I had a lesson with her, I started warming up and she said, stop, stop, just stop, stop singing. Wow. We have a lot of work to do. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> and she said, you need to see a voice therapist. And it turned out I had nodules on my vocal folds. Oh my bumps God. On there for people who don't know what those are. Nodes, nodules, they're, you know, it's an injury. And so I had to have voice therapy to learn how to speak in a healthy way. I had to get the acid reflux under control. I didn't realize I had that. So I got a medicine for that, changed my diet. It was all these things. But then once that got under control and I started really improving my technique on healthy vocal folds, not injured vocal folds, it really started to improve my capabilities of what I could do with my voice. And that same teacher who was extremely hard on me one day after I sang through something said, you know, I pay money to hear that. And I said, really? Oh, wow. <laughs> then I think a day that changed everything for me when I considered that it could be 
a career for me was when someone named Darren Woods came and did a master class for us. And he heard me sing. He said, well, I know you're studying to be a choral conductor, but I think you could have a path in opera. And I said, oh really? And so he took me into his summer program with a full scholarship, Siegel Music Colony, and then gave me professional work as a studio artist and then on the main stage at Fort Worth Opera Festival in Texas. And so I moved out there after doing a young artist program in Opera Carolina. And from there, did some other young artist programs. Uh, Santa Fe Opera was a really meaningful experience for me and eventually moved to New York and as a home base there, traveled 10 months out of the year performing year round and making a living doing it. So I felt extremely lucky uh, to have that opportunity. So I guess that is the opera side of it. And so to give the part about development, that was also something I never thought that I would do. But there reached a point where the opera business was changing and my opportunities were, I saw that I could continue working and I was still getting offers and for contracts and roles and I was loving what I was doing. And I was in my 30s at this point and I will be honest and say I'm not independently wealthy. <laughs> I don't come from a super affluent background. And I said, hmm, at what point do I need to start adulting with no health insurance, with no benefits, no retirement, no paid time off? I was thinking about my future. And as someone who needs to be independent, what is the wise thing to do with my life? What is the priority? I love and I have a passion for the arts, but I think it might be time to start thinking about some stability <laughs> because I was seeing people who were really scared, people in their 40s and 50s and saying, what am I going to do to try and make a life for myself when the arts are not providing that part for me? And so I had a number of contracts and holds on my <laughs> schedule that fell through. And I thought, well, you know, that, that's just the reality of things. And companies were closing, performances were being canceled, contracts were just falling through, and people were going a different direction. And I said, okay, I'm just going to consider other options. And I had an opportunity presented to me to join Opera Saratoga, not to be confused with Sarasota. <laughs> in Saratoga very important Springs, difference to the with, listeners. Yes, yeah. very different. <laughs> in upstate New York with Larry Edelson, who I actually met at the same time and place that I met you in Israel. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and just uh, to uh, brief, I'm just going to briefly uh, interject that uh, I actually first met John Blaylock when he was singing Tonio, that's the leading man, in Donizetti's opera, La Fille du Regiment, in Israel, I, uh, I, we absolutely hit it off, and I fell in love with his voice, and it's been history ever since. And in any way, please continue. I did uh, want to say that. I loved that program. That was my favorite summer experience ever, and it's a very special place for me and a meaningful place for me because who knew then that I would meet so many people that I would cross paths with in such a life-changing way? My boss who was Larry Edelson, and also my current boss, Thomas Wulun. I mm -hmm. also met there that summer. Yeah. Who knew? <laughs> right, what are that the was odds? In, that was in 2010. And all these years later, these people are still in my life, and I'm so grateful for that. And he offered me an opportunity to be the manager of development and patron relations, I think was the name of the title. And I said, oh my goodness, I have to ask people for money. I'm going to hate that. But I said, it's an opportunity. I'm going to take it. And I didn't want to leave New York City. I was scared. But I said, what's the worst that can happen? And I said, philosophy, I try to have. Make friends with the worst that can happen. And if push comes to shove, at the end of the day, whatever cliche you want to throw in there, if it doesn't work out, you can always 
stop. You can always go back to New York. You can always pivot again and try something else. So I said, nothing ventured, nothing gained. I'm going for it. And I, I found that I loved it. I enjoyed it. I had an affinity for it. It was another way to engage with the arts, to continue being part of it, and to continue connecting with people. And yeah. asking, it's not all about just, it's not begging. It's aligning people's passion with their ability to help. And they enjoy it. People love being helpful and they have the ability to be helpful. And many of them are just looking for the opportunity. And many of them are just waiting for someone to ask. And if they mm -hmm. can, they will. And if they don't want to, they won't. And that's okay. And that's what your job is. And they understand that. And so then Thomas Willen and I kept in touch very loosely. We were, you know, LinkedIn, Facebook, I followed him. I crossed paths with him along the way. We were working in some of the same places. And he asked me one time if I would join the Atlanta opera team. And I said, I would really be interested in living in Atlanta. I really appreciate and am honored by this request, but I can't leave the team here in Saratoga because it was in the middle of their season and mm -hmm. it was a very small staff, a very small company. And I just, felt loyal and I would not want to leave them in the lurch. But then I went to the Opera America conference in San Francisco a couple of months later and he said, let me take you to breakfast. <laughs> and he <laughs> offered me again an opportunity. And then he said, do you have plans for lunch? And I said, well, no. Well, let me have Micah, our executive director, take you to lunch. And I was saying, well, I should keep this going. I might get a free dinner too while I'm at it. <laughs> and then... Uh, they offered me the job and I accepted it and I loved living in Atlanta and it's been a wonderful chance for me. And I am so grateful to still be involved and, and I'm still singing too on the side. So it's not an either or, and I feel that I'm doing what I'm meant to be doing. And it's a very fortunate place to be. Absolutely. That's beautiful. And uh, I was giving kind of a few amens about seven time zones away. We are seven time zones apart for all of you listening uh, out there. And uh, and I just absolutely love what you said uh, about singing and also what you said uh, about development and how it's a way to um, uh, to, uh, you know, to uh, work with those who make uh, the arts possible and, uh, you know, work in tandem with them. And that it really is another way to uh, to be very much uh, to be very in in the arts and much in the way that singing is. It's another way to connect with people. So that's just so beautiful. And, One thing uh, I meant to say that I forgot mm -hmm. was, so many singers feel frustrated with the business and with the lack of opportunity, and they see things that they wish would change and be different. And there's a lot of complaining <laughs> because yes. it's really hard. And I thought I can continue complaining along with everyone else, or I can try something different to actually change the situation. I can keep fighting that reality or I can be the change. And so I find that what, with what the kind of thing that you and I are doing in our full-time role, I, I think you're still doing this, right? <laughs> you have yes. been, mm -hmm. is making that difference instead of just constantly saying, oh, why is it this way? Shouldn't they do better? And saying, okay, well, I can keep talking about it or I can do something. Mm, yes, absolutely. So just being uh, somebody who's doing or at least trying to do that. And and I, I absolutely love that. So uh, then not only... Um, there's no kind of sitting on the sidelines in any way. You're really taking things into uh, your own hands in uh, the capacity uh, that you can to make a difference and in every way that you can. And I really do think it's important to uh, convey that you can do it in a way that's very multifaceted and not like, oh, I can only be a singer. I can only be, a, you know, insert job role here. So, uh, and I really think that opens... It, it's a very good way of opening people up to serve in uh, various uh, capacities as well. So I, I think that is so great. And I actually do want, because we've been talking so much about singing, but I haven't played any of your singing yet. So I wanted to do that. And uh, we will be uh, beginning with a recording 
of uh, the aria Je crois en fendre. So this is Nadir's aria from uh, Georges Bizet's The Pearl Fishers. So uh, first of all, I just have to show you. This is my arm, and it has goosebumps <laughs> on it. <laughs> so, oh, you're so sweet. So, Thank you. But seriously, that is such stunning singing. singing. Thank you so much. And uh, I didn't want to let another moment pass without uh, our listeners having a chance to hear you. And uh, yeah, so this is actually a perfect way to segue into our next question. So uh, tell us about some of your favorite roles. Oh my goodness. When people would ask me when I was singing full time, what's your favorite role? It, my answer would always be whatever I was singing at the moment. So if I was singing Tamino, Tamino, you know, if I was singing <laughs> Pong in, you know, <laughs> turned out Pong. Right. So that's Tamino <laughs> in Mozart's magic flute. So <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, but the one I have to say that you, we're going to, I think, maybe hear a bit of that. The one that I think was personally the most meaningful to me was the title role in Paul's case because I connected so much with the story. And I found that I had a niche in 21st century music because of the way my voice is and also my interest in new music. 
and my ability to learn weird <laughs> new <laughs> roles. There's a special energy around creating something new as opposed to re-envisioning or recreating something that had been written hundreds of years ago, though that music, like the Pearl Fishers, I love and it's gorgeous and it's all meaningful. But to me, I connect with it more when it's something that no one's ever done before. And also you don't fall into the trap of being compared with everyone mm. else because there's not necessarily a right way to do it. <laughs> the right oh way God, is yes. the way you're doing it at that moment. And you don't have to say, well, Carlos did it this way or, you know, yeah. whatever. <laughs> and I felt a lot of similarities with that character in the story uh, by Willa Cather. And so that was very, very special. And there was a camaraderie with my colleagues along the way. And I enjoyed every minute. And it was also something that ended up being critically very successful. And we got to do it a couple of times and then got to record it. And that was just wonderful. That was one that was one of my favorites. And I loved doing Pang actually in Turandot. And again, it was not as much only the music. I love that score. It was the experience of being able to sing with people that I love. I My best friend uh, ended up being Ping and my brother ended oh, up being fine. Pong. So Ping, Pang, Pong. <laughs> and I actually got them both the, the job doing that. And then I got my best friend's husband the role of the, not the man, yeah, the Mandarin. I had to think which role. It's not the emperor, but the Mandarin. Uh, mm -hmm. And then I was friends with other people in the cast. And then my parents came out to see it. And my mother's cousin was there. So that was just a fun, fun experience. What is another one of my favorite roles? Oh, another one, two that I love that are more of the standard repertoire are Alma Viva because it's gorgeous music and it's fun. It's a comedy and you get to play three different characters because you have these things called Latsi where you put on disguises and you do hijinks. And so you do different voices and different costumes with the different acts that you're doing to try and disguise in within the story. And it, it's just super, super, super fun. And the other one is Ferrando in Così Fan Tutte because again, Mozart, gorgeous lines, legato, such beautiful music. I mean, Una Ora Amorosa is one of the most beautiful arias ever written. But also you get to be so silly. And again, in the Turki, you get to come in with crazy mustaches and, and act silly and pretend like you're dying and fainting. And <laughs> it's just so, so much fun. Another one that you mentioned, Ramiro, it's beautiful music and it's a great story. It's classic. But as the prince, you don't get to be as silly. I like being <laughs> silly in real life and on the stage. Yeah. So, by the way, um, uh, Prince Ramiro, uh, for those of you who don't know, he, first of all, La Cenerentola, which is Rossini's opera, that is uh, Rossini's take on the Cinderella story. And uh, Prince Ramiro is the Prince Charming character. So that's who uh, John Blaylock played, and that's who he's talking about. And uh, I also have more, uh, I admit, I have more of a soft spot for Count Almaviva than uh, Prince Ramiro for a lot of the reasons that uh, you said. That's just so much fun, that there's so many hijinks and all the disguises and all the different voices you get to do, and that you're essentially playing different characters within the same opera. That is super fun. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, in any case, uh, this is actually, this is something you touched on a little bit, uh, especially when uh, talking about uh, Paul's case and then also about uh, a lot of the uh, Mozart and Rossini operas. Uh, how uh, did your experience in both the standard rep and the 21st century rep inform each other? The bottom line for both that I think is so important and that should be a given, but it's not always, is Preparation. Prepare, prepare, prepare <laughs> in every way. First of all, learn the music. <laughs> it what was shocking to me. <laughs> and I know that that's obvious, but it was shocking to me how many times I would show up to a job in the world of opera, as I'm sure you are well aware, but maybe some of our listeners may not be. On day one of rehearsal, you are supposed to show up having all of the music, all of the words, regardless of language, 
learned and memorized, period, full stop. (laughs) And it was shocking to me how many times I would show up to a rehearsal of a new piece or even a standard piece that had been around for hundreds of years. And some of my colleagues, it seemed that they were cracking open that score for the very first time. Wow. And you know, I'd been studying it for months, learning, memorizing, coaching, you know, preparing. And so first of all, you learn your music. And second of all, be technically vocally ready with it because you really have to practice it, not just to learn it mentally, but to have it in your voice, as they say, in your body, physically, to feel comfortable with it because each role has its unique challenges. If it is a super high role, you have to get comfortable with that vocal range. If it's a different language that you don't speak, you have to not only learn what it means word for word, not just what you're singing, but what everybody in the scene is singing so you can play that character and be in the moment, but also you have to be comfortable with forming those sounds in your mouth without screwing up and tightening your throat and your breathing. So for me, those things did not come naturally. I had to spend a lot of time and really prepare and make sure that I was doing it to the best of my ability because otherwise, even if you feel kind of secure with it, once you start throwing in staging and you get into costume, all that you're trying to do technically can sometimes go out the window. So it almost has to be second nature and muscle memory, just like an athlete does a gymnastics routine. They do it, do it, do it until it's just automatic. Some like a a basketball player throwing a free throw. You just have it ingrained in your body. So you have to do the same thing for standard repertoire or for 21st century new music. And that is, I think, something that I learned that is equally important, but almost, I think you have to be more prepared and it takes a little longer to learn a crazy new challenging 21st century piece. And so I took that same level of preparation, hopefully for when I was doing standard repertoire, because the more prepared you are, the better you do. And the more you can play around within that baseline of text and music on the page. And I think it'll be a more interesting and meaningful performance. Yeah, a hundred percent. I think uh, a lot of people listening don't uh, might uh, might not necessarily realize that, uh, in essence, as opera singers, there's a lot of sort of patting your head and uh, rubbing your stomach at the same time and walking and chewing gum. I mean, it's uh, having the having the full role in your voice while acting and doing staging and oftentimes, let's say, running or doing something quite active while you're singing and having to project over an orchestra. And doing so in languages such as Italian, French, German, uh, Russian, uh, what have you. And uh, also being engaged as scene partners, you know, really acting uh, with your colleagues. I mean, it's uh, it's a lot. And uh, it's just so interesting uh, hearing you uh, talk about this because on one hand, it sounds to me like the process of preparing a role in a 21st century, uh, a 21st century opera when you're essentially giving birth to the piece is uh, a lot more um, a, a lot more intensive though in a way that a lot of the standard repertoire preparation should be as well. And yet with the 21st uh, century uh, repertory, there's uh, paradoxically a lot of uh, freedom as far as the as far as interpretation because you're not sort of competing with the ghosts of you know Maria Callas and uh, Anna Moffo, Joan Sutherland, you know Luciano Pavarotti, uh, what have you. So it's just uh, interest, uh, one. Of, I actually never quite contemplated the notion of there being so much preparation, but then being a freedom later in the process. But I, I think you're you're absolutely uh, dead on on both fronts. And uh, we'll actually listen to a clip of uh, Paul's case uh, later in this interview. I'm so excited for you all to hear him. And uh, before we do that, I do want to ask you. Uh, what role is there for opera to tell modern stories? And especially since uh, you did excel in uh, 21st century opera. Well, thank you. For me, something that makes it important is that people are telling stories that are making a difference in the world. Those are the ones that people connect with. They're not retelling stories of gods and monsters and kings and queens. It's more 
today. It's things that are happening uh, around the world in the news when you open the paper each day. And sometimes you can have something that isn't lasting that way because if it's based on something with technology, I think of certain operas that I've heard that people don't understand the technicalities of what's happening. I don't want to call out any specific pieces uh, because I don't want to cast aspersions on anything, but it's about the human experience in a way that people can connect with today. If they're seeing stories about things historically, sometimes I don't think it feels as real to them and they can't relate to the characters and the stories on the stage. So for instance, we're doing something at the Atlanta Opera called the 96 hour opera competition. And without turning it into a commercial for that, I'll just share what I'm excited about it is it's stories of Georgia and we're partnering with different groups in Georgia to tell unsung heroes and the struggles, the hard fought one struggles from these underrepresented groups. And then also pairing them with composers and librettists specifically of underrepresented people to give them an opportunity where they otherwise wouldn't have one. And it's going to be a cash prize and they're going to have the opportunity, the winner to have a full commission for the Atlanta opera. So it's stories that haven't been told by people who haven't had the opportunity to tell those stories. And that's what new opera can do. And that's what animates me. And that's what gets me really excited. Um, That was the thing about Paul's case. It dealt with identity and it dealt with people who were misunderstood and outcast and not embraced by their community. And I think about Fellow Travelers, another piece that Gregory Spears wrote, which is about the Lavender Scare. It was bringing to the fore, I think, a story that not as many people know about. And for me, I just sobbed and sobbed and sobbed sobbed when I heard the music because it was so beautiful and soaring and also very heartbreaking for me. Uh, The persecution and then the loss and uh, the missed opportunities in these people's lives. So that's what I love. Dead Man Walking is another one that changed my life. What That one is especially relevant for me because I will be completely candid and say my understanding of and my stance on the death penalty changed when I read the book, sang the opera, met Sister Helen Prejean, uh, who wrote the book and, and the book and the movie and the opera are all based on that story. Uh, and it changed me and it, it was the reason why I educated myself on that subject. And so that, that is what opera has the opportunity to do. And that's what I think is so beautiful about it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, because fundamentally, opera really is about the human voice, you know, both literal and figurative, and what an incredible platform um, uh, that Atlanta Opera is giving. I mean, a Atlanta Opera, but then also say opera companies in general, who uh, give the opportunities for stories to be told that should be told. And then it's a win-win, because then not only is is there light, uh, do do, uh, people have light um, uh, shining on those stories, but then it also keeps the art form going. So it really is a win-win all around. And it, it really is incredible and exciting to see the directions in which 21st Opera uh, is going and to And I go. love both. And I, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. I, yeah, I go apologize. for it. Yeah. But just like with films, I just watched The Tragedy of Macbeth, the new film starring Francis uh, McDormand Denzel and Denzel Washington. Washington. Mm-hmm. Pardon? Oh, sorry, with Denzel Washington? Yes, yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. And so I think that there's always room to continue the classics. And we I don't think we should ever throw that out and only do new things. But what is exciting about that film, for instance, is that they're doing something new with the classic. And so I think that even if pieces sometimes are quote unquote problematic, I know that that is something that the opera world deals with, with, oh, well, you know, these stories, are you lifting up the wrong kinds of messages about certain kinds of people. 
I think that there's room to have a discussion about it and not just throw away anything that's challenging. I think that is what the purpose of art is, is to get you to discuss things and to wrestle with these problems. I think that if you only deal with things that are easy, A, to me, that's not fun. <laughs> and B, okay. I think you're missing out on the chance to learn and to grow from our mistakes in the past. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And especially when uh, there's the chance to contextualize um, uh, those uh, problematic operas. Uh, I think I think that's really important. And then people can learn from that, can grow from that without erasing and I don't want to get too into the weeds with this, but it's good to not sort of erase opera history while also recognizing, um, kind of recognizing the elements that that were problematic and uh, moving forward. So I completely agree with you. So in any case, I will also ask, uh, ask if you find that your experiences in singing formed your experiences in development as well, in arts development, and if so, how? 100%. When I'm speaking with people about opera, people who like investing in opera often have a deep and abiding passion for it. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they're supporting for more communitarian reasons, but often they're people who are diehard opera fans and they say, oh, well, have you heard this singer? And it's interesting to be able to say, yes, the person's a friend of mine. I sang with <laughs> him or her and blah, 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 you know, whatever, at the Kennedy Center, et cetera, whatever. And in order to be a successful development person, fundraiser, you have to be interested and interesting. <laughs> and it's not only talking about yourself, but being present, as I said, and then also listening to what the other person is interested in. And if they like opera, if they like the arts, it helps to just know about the art form. And not only talk about yourself, but if they ask you questions, be able to share that in the moment. And that's why I love working in opera. And that's why I think it's more personally meaningful to me than if I were working for another kind of a nonprofit, which all of them are worthy, healthcare, education. I believe in all of those things very strongly, but opera is what my experience has been. And that's why I love working in that field right now. Absolutely. And then that love for it comes across and that it helps make it possible to build, you know, to uh, to work with others, to make opera even better. So so I just love the fact that you said that. And uh, anecdotally, that's something I've found in uh, my own life as well. And uh, also tell us, you know, as per the name of the show, something rather than nothing. Uh, tell us, uh, why is there something rather than nothing? I wish I knew. <laughs> the, question, <laughs> the question of why is not something that I feel that I have the qualifications to answer in a in an intelligent way. I think that's all more answers go. <laughs> it's more for a philosopher to, to answer, but I'm more interested and I, I'm grappling more each day with the questions of how and what and where. Uh, not so much why, because that, that's getting really deep. But a little bit of my background is that I grew up in an extremely religious home, a very conservative religious home. And I was in a society that was in certain ways very limiting and restrictive to me. And then what my escape from the parts that were hurtful to me and that were really hard for me, uh, it ended up being opera was my way out to finding a broader worldview, people that were more tolerant and accepting of me as a person. And that's when I felt safe to come out of the closet and be true to who I am. And that's why opera will always be special to me. And so for me, the something rather than nothing is not, in my opinion, it is not the conventional definition of what God is in terms of the way I grew up. For me, it is the connection with other humans. And for me, that is what is a sacred time and space is when we come together to share the human experience in a shared catharsis. And that is what makes us, in my opinion, 
different from animals. <laughs> we, I love the quote that we are a little lower than the angels, but we still have feet of clay. <laughs> and so we are still mammals. We all still have our base instincts, but we are also capable of innovation, of science, and of such beauty. And that is what drives me. That's why I get out of bed every morning. And that's why I go to work every day. Because to me, it's not just about experiencing that bliss, experiencing the sublime of those goosebumps, as we talked about, but also it's about making a difference in the world, moving the needle in a positive direction. And for someone like me, when I was younger, really saving my life, because I believe mm -hmm. that if I had not found the people that I did along the way, and it happened to just take the form of opera. I think that things would have ended very badly for me and much earlier. I don't think I would still be alive today. Mm. You know, I actually, as you were speaking just now, I got a little bit verklempt and I'm actually teary eyed a bit on the other end. I mean, just hearing about how opera had such a profound effect uh, on your life, your ability to feel safe, and to uh, connect with those around you. I mean, that is just so beautiful. And what a privilege. So thank you so much again for being on the show and for shining this light, sharing this light with us. You're a gem. Well, thank you for the opportunity. And I thank you for sharing your story as well. You have a story to tell and you do it beautifully. Aw. Well, thank you so much. It's been such a privilege having you on the show, and I'm so excited for uh, people to find out more about you. Thank you. Just one minute.